Good afternoon. I'm Suzanne Borden, Moment Magazine Zoominar producer, and I'd like to welcome you to today's program. How should we define anti-Semitism and who should define it? Today's program, which is being recorded, is in partnership with Moment Magazine and the Conference of Presidents of Major American Jewish Organizations and is made possible with the support of the Joyce and Irving Goldman Family Foundation. Please type your questions in the Q&A box and we'll try to get to as many as possible at the end of the session. Following the program, please visit Moment's website where you will find a variety of articles on the topic of anti-Semitism and you can sign up to receive Moment's anti-Semitism monitor. Be sure to register for next week's Zoominar, The Unfinished Presidency of Jimmy Carter with historian Kai Bird and journalist Dan Raviv. It is now my pleasure to introduce Malcolm Holmline, who in 1986 was elected Executive Vice Chairman of the Conference of Presidents of Major American Jewish Organizations, the coordinating body on international and national concerns for 52 national Jewish organizations. Previously, he served as the founding executive director of the Jewish Community Relations Council of Greater New York. Prior to that, he was the founding executive director of the Greater New York Conference on Soviet Jewry. Malcolm has traveled throughout the world, meeting with world leaders and Jewish communities. He has written and lectured across the United States and abroad on the topics of international relations, Israel and Middle East affairs, Soviet and world Jewry, terrorism, the American Jewish community, and intergroup relations. Please welcome Malcolm Holmline. And thank you very much. Uh, on behalf of the conference, I want to thank Moment Magazine, you and all of the others who were involved in helping bringing this to fruition. It's a very important discussion at a very timely and important uh, occasion in Jewish history, in Jewish life. And we have a panel of really outstanding experts to join us and to explore various aspects of the issues related to Jew hatred here and abroad. And on behalf of William Daroff, who will, who will be participating as well, and myself, the conference is really honored to be part of this uh, event and looks forward to a very meaningful discussion. We have uh, a number of very important people participating in this first part, led by Ira Foreman, who will conduct the discussion Everyone knows Ira as the former State Department Special Envoy to monitor and combat anti-Semitism and now professor and senior fellow at Georgetown University Center for Jewish Civilization and an advisor on anti-Semitism for Human Rights First. And he has contributed so much to this discussion over the years and to the battle against anti-Semitism. Mark Weitzman, who is Director of Government Affairs for the Simon Wiesenthal Center, is a member of the official U.S. delegation to the International Holocaust Remembrance Authority and played a key role, both as chairman of the Committee on Anti-Semitism and Holocaust Denial. He was the architect of the IRA adoption of the working definition and the author of the uh, definition, the working definition of Holocaust denial and distortion. He's played a key role in so many organizations, publications uh, over the years. He's really a, a treasure of the Jewish community and we are welcome him and thank him for participating along with somebody who has probably been one of the pioneer voices and most important voices on the issue of anti-Semitism. She has served it as Yad Vashem's chief historian since 2010, but she currently is also the head of the Cantor Center for the Study of Contemporary European Jewry, the head of the Department of Jewish History at the Rosenberg School for Jewish Studies, and the Alfred Slaner Chair in Anti-Semitism and Racism at Tel Aviv University. But her works go far beyond it. She's won many prizes, book awards, but she has been one of the leading experts, people analyzing the issues related to anti-Semitism, served for the Israel's foreign uh, ministry and delegations to UN World Conferences, and an academic advisor to the International Task Force on Holocaust Education, Remembrance, and Research. There's so much more about each of them that could be said, but I think their words will speak for them and that we not take more time for, away from the discussion that will follow. So thank you all for participating and we look forward to hearing it and joining you later. Thank you, Malcolm, and uh, welcome to all our participants and good afternoon. Since the, uh, about 15 years ago, 2004, 2005, we have all had uh, some uh, document that looks like and called the working definition of anti-Semitism. Uh, but in particularly the last five or six years, 
this working definition, which is now generally called the IRA working definition of anti-Semitism, uh, has gained a, a support with governments, with NGOs, with universities, with prosecutorial and um, judicial organizations, as well as police forces. Um, but as that support has grown, including 30 countries, uh, there has been some opposition. And uh, I am aware that this President's Conference took um, a great interest in the working definition as long as eight or nine months ago, at least to my knowledge, in trying to get more of these organizations to join on board. Um, and uh, we put together this seminar in that light that this was one of the most important issues facing the uh, folks who are gonna be trying to combat anti-Semitism in coming years. However, in recent months, we've had another incident, which is a new wave of anti-Semitism uh, associated with the violence in Gaza, Israel and the Temple Mount uh, in, during 11 days in May. And we thought we can't address an issue of anti-Semitism and particularly the working definition unless we also talk about what happened in May. So we're gonna try to touch on two topics today. What is the working definition? Who devised it? Who's adopted it? Who is criticizing it and why? the wave of anti-Semitism that we've all seen, not just in the United States, but in Canada and Europe, South America, um, and its aftermath. And frankly, the intersection of the two topics. Uh, our panelists, Mark Weitzman and Dina Parat, as Malcolm indicated, probably know more about the working definition have spent time on it and devising it than anybody else uh, in the Jewish world. And frankly, in terms of topics of anti-Semitism, have been engaged uh, at the highest level in combating this scourge. Uh, I want to start with a couple of questions for Mark and Dina. And I'd like you also, as you uh, give us your answers, tell us a little bit of why you think the working definition is important. But before we do that, uh, Suzanne, can you put up a copy of the working definition on the screen for our audience? So as all of you can see, the working definition is quite short. It's just a little paragraph. Uh, Anti-Semitism is a certain perception of Jews, which may be expressed as hatred toward Jews. Rhetorical and physical manifestations of anti-Semitism are directed toward Jewish or non-Jewish individuals and or their property toward Jewish community institutions and religious facilities. We go to the next page. But though this is the working definition, there are actually additional parts of it uh, or explanatory parts. Um, and I think this paragraph is important. And the second, I would ask you to look at the second sentence. However, criticism of Israel, similar to that level against any other country, cannot be regarded as anti-Semitism. Remember that point. Let's go to the next uh, slide. Um, I'd like you to look at this first uh, sentence which precedes all the 11 examples of the working definition. Contemporary examples of anti-Semitism in public life, the media, schools, and the workplace, and in the religious sphere could, taking into account the overall context, include, but are not eliminated, too. And then we have 11 examples that uh, our guests, our panelists will address some of, the, some of them. So let's start with, um, uh, if I could go to, Dina, Dina, can you tell us a little bit about the context in which the working definition in 2004, 2005 was devised, who collaborated and developed it? What were the circumstances that you and others uh, were taking into account as you were thinking about the importance of a definition like this? And how was it initially received in Europe and the Middle East and the United States? Dina, you have to, again, have to unmute yourself. Yeah, here it is. Okay. I hear you. Okay, yeah. Okay, so shalom to everyone again. I see that we have some 200 uh, listeners. Shalom to every one of them. 
and uh, good night to you all from Tel Aviv. Um, as, and as to your question, into uh, the origins of uh, the working definition that has been um, worded, decided upon in 2004-2005, and then it has another phase being adopted, readopted uh, by the IRA uh, in May 19, uh, 2016. The early one has its roots in the Durban conference. And I think it's very important to, to say that. Um, I had uh, not the pleasure, uh, the Durban conference was no pleasure, but the honor to be a member of the Israeli foreign ministry delegation to Durban. And it, it was, as we all remember, 2001, end of August, beginning of September, it ended two days before the 9-11. It was 9-11, two days before the 9-11. It was supposed to be a UN World Conference on Racism, and it turned out in a matter of two days into a tirade against Israel and against the Jewish people. It was, you could see this, I, we were there. You could see this in the making. And this conference proved to be a turning point. It proved to be a turning point into a phase that we later called new anti-Semitism because it became clear in 2002, three, that the new phase of anti-Semitism is characterized by more violence, more Muslim involvement, more Muslim propaganda, money, violence. Uh, it was taken by gov some governments uh, as well, but it also uh, spreaded in, West, in the Western world uh, in a way uh, that we have not heard uh, before. In the 1990s, which were uh, much calmer than that. And so it became clear that you have to do something. Not only that, the situation worsened. In 2004, the cases, the number of violent cases against Jews worldwide doubled in comparison to 2003. In 2004, therefore, the German government had a, convened, convened uh, a conference in Berlin and one of the main decisions was we need a definition of antisemitism so that we would be able to counter it, to define it, to know what it is, this new one, and de define it. And then we will we'll be able to have some steps against it. So first of all, this is part of the background. I'm saying part because there was another, uh, another source. And this is that in 2000, there was a huge conference in Stockholm convened by the Swedish prime minister at the time with some 47 heads of state for the beginning of the millennium with the purpose of keeping the memory of the Holocaust alive and fighting anti-Semitism in the new millennium. And from there, another source also joined the effort of having a definition. Now, uh, this is a, for a bit of a background. You also asked, uh, Ira, uh, who, who were the, the perpetrators of this, uh, of this uh, definition? What uh, differentiates this definition from former ones is that former ones can be found in any encyclopedia, in any lexicon. You have dozens of uh, 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 um, definitions of antisemitism, but the former ones, each of them was worded, commissioned, uh, commissioned from a scholar who sat down and wrote what he wrote. Here, there was a joint effort 
It was a joint effort of many Jewish organizations, scholars, who we all sent propositions and ideas, and they were collected under the guidance of uh, uh, Rabbi Andy Baker, uh, working then uh, and until today, in fact, uh, in the AJC, the uh, American Jewish uh, uh, Committee. They were gathered, they were distributed again, we debated. You couldn't, of course, reach a full agreement from everyone on everything. This is absolutely impossible. For instance, I don't like the word in the definition, hatred, hatred toward Jews. Doesn't have to be hatred, it's very emotional. Hostility is also enough. And there are many people who, leaders especially, who use emotions against the Jews while they themselves don't have to be anti-Semites, but they use and manipulate uh, the, the situation and the emotions. So it is a joint effort. Also, please note, it's just one page and the uh, Bekoshi a half, one page and a half. It's simple, it's clear. It does not philosophize on who is a Jew, who is an anti-Semite, why is he an anti-Semite? What's the history of anti-Semitism? This, uh, you need uh, some dozens of books for that. It simply says what anti-Semitism is in two sentences, gives some explanations, and then gives a, um, examples. So it's a clear and um, to the point. Um, you had one more benefit, not only the working definition itself, but the work, the coordinated work among many, uh, among, as we said, many scholars. It is not a, an everyday phenomenon in the Jewish world that we work together, we have one achievement together, and this was, I would say, one more side uh, benefit. Uh, if I have uh, still a minute or so, um, uh, let me say also the following. Uh, it didn't dawn on us in 2004-05 that there would be in some 10, 15 years, critics would say that it is in the way, it is an obstacle in the way of uh, the freedom of speech. Uh, that it stifles the possibility to criticize, especially Israel. Among the 11 examples, there are four, four, which say when anti-Zionism or anti-Israelism is in fact expressed in anti-Semitic motives and terms, only four. There is more mentioning of Israel, but then it is in relation to Jewish uh, communities. Now, why is that? Why were these four points brought into the, um, into the uh, definition. Because the new anti-Semitism, as we said, was about violence, about more Muslim involvement, more government involvement, but it also was, since the Durban conference, it was also about more anti-Zionism, a fierce one, sharp one, that was, again, wasn't there before. So you needed to address it. And the definition was the first document that addressed, frankly, these four points of when anti-Zionism is in fact anti-Semitism, or at least in anti-Semitic terms and uh, uh, symbols. Now, then came the complaint that Gewalt, it does not allow freedom of speech. But what can I say? Israel is being criticized from morning to night in Israel and outside Israel. So where is this stifling of the freedom of speech? Everyone says whatever they like, day and night. So I, I really don't see how this complaint uh, is there in the being. Also an important explanatory a sentence in the definition says 
it is a non legally binding document non legally binding which means you cannot take someone who said or did something that is in one of the examples the 11 examples take him to court and say or go on please punish him he did this and that no it's non legally binding but it has turn, turned since 2005, when it was first adopted in Cordova, Spain, uh, in June 2005. Um, it was, um, sorry, before that, the beginning of 2005, it was acknowledged by the EUMC, um, European Union Monitoring Center, then in Vienna. Today, it is the FRA. A, a, a variation of this uh, institute, a fundamental rights uh, agency. So 2005, it is internationally acknowledged, acknowledged uh, and um, adopted. It is not legally binding, but since then, since being adopted, it is being used in order to monitor, better monitor in order to teach policemen to whom complaints are being filed. You can go to court in countries that have a law against anti-Semitism, racism, etc., and have the definition help you, help you, not be the main instrument, but um, help you. Um, and so it has proved to be since the the last uh, 50 in the, the during the last 15 years, 16 years, um, the 2005, yes, until today it's 16 years, uh, to be a useful tool, a useful tool. And um, I must say that this tool was adopted during the last five years, since its adoption in 2016 in Romania. I was there and I had the pleasure of working with Mark Weizmann and with the Romanian chair, Constantinescu, may he rest in peace. And since then, we were working on, on the adoption, on the way of adapting for the adoption. Since then, until today, more than 500, 500 countries, football teams, universities, local council, religious institute, etc., etc., have adopted it, most of them during the last year and a half. The more it was adopted and the more it was recognized uh, as a tool, as a statement of values, as an important statement of uh, values, it uh, rose, it gave rise to Criticism, of course, the more it succeeded, the more it gave a rise. You know, I, 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 uh, see, I, I see, I, Ira, I, that you are taking air in order to tell me <laughs> that my time is over. So that's okay. I want to hear Mark a little bit. Um, uh, Dina, thank you. And, and uh, you covered some things I was going to ask Mark about what's happened in the in intervening 15 years. Um, Mark, uh, talk to us a little bit about what, how widely uh, accepted the working definition has become, because in that first 10 or uh, 10, 10 years or so, uh, there weren't this kind of avalanche of countries and NGOs adopting it. Talk about that, but also let's uh, hear from you a little bit. There have been, we, I alluded to before, criticisms in recent years as it has gain wine spread its acceptance criticisms that it uh, as Dina said that it uh, uh, eliminates speech or attempts to quash speech that's critical of Israel I'd like you to go back to the uh, the actual wording about what it says about criticism of Israel but also the con the set the concept of of uh, con context that all these examples have to be taken into consider with context, why that was put in uh, and why that may address some of these concerns. Thanks, Ira. Um, first of all, thank you for the invitation to be here, especially with Dina, who's such an integral part of it. 
and William and Malcolm, who've been leading the, the battle on these things for so many years um, and are now teaming up in an incredible way. It's just an honor to be here with them. Um, I want to begin, <coughs> I'm going to kind of try to fill in some of the uh, gaps that you know Dina touched upon, but perhaps didn't have time to go into. Um, so to begin with, Ira was originally, and I was present in Stockholm in, in 2000 as a presenter and as a member of the U.S. delegation. Um, and what Ira is, it's an international organization, an intergovernmental organization, meaning that membership in Ira is on a formal governmental level, a high governmental level, um, headed by uh, diplomats, usually from the foreign ministry, senior diplomats from the foreign ministry. And what the decisions taking at Ira, first of all, are taken by consensus, meaning every country has to sign off on it. Secondly, while they are not um, binding in the sense of a treaty, they have political significance. They bind or, or have an impact on the governments of the countries involved. Um, and uh, the, the policies that they agree to through IRA are considered to be the country's policies as well. Um, having said that, what we began with was around, um, it actually was the second definition that we began with. Um, because we began and had an adoption of a definition of work, working definition of Holocaust denial and distortion in 2013. That took five years to get across um, mm -hmm. and to get adopted. Um, and the reason was because the question of Holocaust denial was simple for everyone to sign off on. Holocaust distortion struck certain countries, um, and we know the countries I'm talking about in Eastern Europe and so on, um, as being very difficult for them to accept because it cut into directly into their attempts to rehabilitate or to whitewash Nazi war criminals, the history of collaboration, and so on. And it was contentious, it was difficult, it was a long drawn out process. Once we finished that in Toronto under the chairmanship of the uh, Canadian chairmanship in 2013, fall 2013, we decided to turn our attention to anti-Semitism. At that point, we were in the middle of um, a wave, another wave of, of anti-Semitic uh, violence and activity, particularly in Europe. Uh, which would peak the next year in 2014. Um, with, at that time, there was the Operation Protective Edge in Gaza. Um, and we realized very simply that we could not afford the luxury of taking another five-year process to get the second anti-Semitism definition through. So we looked around for a definition that was out there that we could shortcut with. And we had, and turned to very quickly, the definition that Dino was describing, the EUMC definition. Now, at that point, that definition had no status. It had never been adopted legally, officially, politically, and so on by any organization. Um, it had been on the website of the EUMC, but was scrubbed from there as part of a general, um, you know, a, a scrubbing of, of non-relevant material. Um, it was questionable whether it was politically motivated or not. But what it meant was that it was really kind of floating around there a little. So we had a very good definition that was, as Dina described excellently, established by, uh, by the by work of many prominent individuals backed by organizations and so on. Um, and we quickly turned to that. And with some really minor editing and tweaking, that became the IRA definition. The process of getting it adopted took another three years there. Now, again, I wanna stress this, this was an open process. The delegations in IRA are not only composed by diplomats who head it, but they're also composed by experts, by academics, by scholars, historians, by museum and memorial working staff, by educators and so on. And the three-year process, we went through every working group. There are three working groups on education, um, academics, and, and museums and memorials. It was up for discussion. We passed it around among the diplomats. So contrary to some of the other definitions that are out there now that are kind of the result of closed processes and that were um, just kind of dropped on the Jewish world, you know, surprise, here's the definition. Um, this was open. This was available for conversation, discussion. It had to be approved at the government level, the, you know, the, the foreign ministry or our government level. Um, and it took a while. It was not a simple process. It was a difficult process in itself. Um, and as Dina described, uh, working together with Ambassador uh, Michnia Konstantinescu, the Romanian chair, who unfortunately passed away at a, a relatively young age a couple of years ago, um, we succeeded in getting it adopted, um, again, by consensus. There were countries that were not happy about it. There were countries that felt that there was... Um, you know, contrary to their policy on Israel or so on and so forth. But nonetheless, they finally agreed to have it done. And so we could say that it gave this multinational organization and multidisciplinary delegates a common agreed upon definition of anti-Semitism to assist in, that work, in their work. We originally thought of it as a tool that, again, non-legally binding, a working definition, working meaning in the sense 
not that it's open for change as much as it's to be used in people's work. Again, Dina rightfully pointed out there are dozens and dozens of academic and scholarly definitions of anti-Semitism. Um, there are books about defining anti-Semitism. Uh, toward a definition of anti-Semitism was a classic in, in, you know, in the field a number of years ago, um, and so on. This has nothing to do with that, in the sense that it drew upon the research and the background and the history, yes, but it was meant in a very specific manner to help all these people from uh, diplomats down to people in the field to go out and work. And why we needed that definition could best be, I think, illustrated with a ex quick example. In summer of 2014, in the middle of that Gaza war, a synagogue in Germany in Wuppertal was firebombed by three um, Palestinians who confessed to it. And two German courts, a regular court and appeals court, said that that wasn't an act of anti-Semitism, but it was a legitimate political protest against Israel. We realized very quickly around that time that if any court system in a Western country can call a firebombing of a synagogue with people in it who had nothing to do with Israel, and some of them perhaps had never even been there and so on, could excuse that as not an anti-Semitic act, we needed a commonly accepted definition of anti-Semitism that would have traction around the world to be able to deal with this issue. Otherwise, people would spin off and say, this is anti-Semitic, this is not anti-Semitic. And, you know, it was just uh, a, a free-for-all, if that's the case. So having done that and having established that uh, for IRA, then we were actually, I think, very surprised to find out that countries seeing the need for it successfully followed, beginning with the UK, um, and then a number of countries, as Dina pointed out, it's up to uh, you know over 25 right now, um, countries have independently adopted the definition to apply it, not just to working on IRA and related issues, but to their own uh, policies internally and as part of their own foreign policy. For example, the United States, the State Department years ago under the Obama administration, and Ira, you know this very well, you were there and part of it, um, responsible for it in many ways, helped post it on their website and saying that this is the definition of anti-Semitism that we use and we hope our allies use. It doesn't mean that anybody's going to jail, again, as Gina, point, Gina pointed out, um, if they say something that can be classified as anti-Semitic, it doesn't target the person, it targets the act. It doesn't target the thinking and so on. It starts and aimed very specifically at actions um, and clarifies what is or is not considered anti-Semitic. So again, we built in safeguards because of the concerns that you raised. It is, to repeat for the fifth time or so, it's non-legally binding. It cannot be used to put somebody in jail on the face of it. It is contextual, meaning that anti-Semitism is fluid, as we all know. Um, some people have described it as a virus that mutates under different conditions. Given that, it's very hard to create a taxonomy, a rigid taxonomy, that you have a checkoff um, that everything could fit into. Obviously, there are certain cases, you know, uh, someone who is attacked um, by a neo-Nazi chanting anti-Semitic slogans, that's clearly an anti-Semitic act. But there are going to be statements, rhetorical statements or other acts that can be contextually questioned or discussed or debated. And we wanted to make sure and make it as elastic as possible um, to be able to deal with that. It's not going to solve every issue. It's not going to be uh, the kind of thing that, if it's adopted, will end anti-Semitism in our time. But it creates an internationally accepted baseline for what anti-Semitism is that can be turned into a practical tool to deal with it. Um, and I think that under those circumstances, um, it has achieved its purpose. The fact that it's been adopted by all these nations, by the Global Imams Council, the largest group of imams, by some of the countries that have uh, signed on the Abraham Accords and the uh, you know, our world have begun talking about adopting it. The United Nations um, has, uh, you know, welcomed it in many ways. Uh, the Organization of American States, um, the European Union has put its full weight behind it. That gives us something we never had before. It gives us really a, um, a way to have a conversation around anti-Semitism where we're all at the same table. We all see the same things. And yes, there are going to be uh, elastic cases that may be debated but it gives us, I think, a much more concrete um, tool than we ever had before. Well, thank you, Mark. I, I think um, one of uh, the things we're finding out is there's a lot of background to the working definition. And uh, we're also wanna be keep in mind that we wanna talk a little bit about now uh, what's just happened uh, 
in response to the fighting in the Middle East in May. And um, if I can ask you both to keep, uh, one or both of you to keep your answers very succinct so we can move on and get questions from the audience. Talk to me about how the working definition has had, uh, it can be looked upon uh, in relation to this outbreak in the United States of anti-Semitism we've seen, not seen before. Well, where we have uh, folks being beat up in front of restaurants in Los Angeles, where we're having uh, and being asked if they're a Jew uh, in the context of uh, free Palestine, where we have people being beat up in Times Square. Can you tell us, uh, Mark, do you have some, some reaction? Yeah, I think that this has really shown how valuable the IRA working definition is, because the other definitions of anti-Semitism, without going into detail, um, kind of bend over backwards to say that um, anti-Semitism should not be linked to the Mideast at all, and, and that um, we have to, as a priority, guard, safeguard the rights of those who are um, pro-Palestinian and criticizing Israel. And I think what this recent events have shown and, and, and proven, unfortunately proven, is that the reality is that when the people that you're talking about were sitting on the streets of the sushi restaurant in Los Angeles or in New York, et cetera, they were not asked if they were Zionists. They were not asked if they voted for Bibi Netanyahu or if they voted for, you know, Naftali Bennett or Yair Lapid or anything like that. They didn't, were not asked if they supported a two-state or one-state solution. They were not asked anything like that. They were asked simply, are you Jews? And if they were Jews, they were open for attack. Meaning, in other words, that the definition of anti-Semitism really was proven in the sense by the actions of the anti-Semites themselves, it is that it is uh, directly at the core of being Jewish. It is not necessarily the positions that you take, but it is the existence of yourself as a Jew that was targeted and is attacked. Out of all those definitions, again, Ira is the only one that goes and addresses that one directly and head on and provides the context necessarily for dealing with it. So I think, unfortunately, the um, recent events have in some ways invalidated um, some of the other you know, discussions. Perhaps it's available. I mean, I welcome, by the way, I welcome more interest on, on anti-Semitism. I think, uh, you know, I welcome the input of scholars and so on. I know some of the people who signed some of the other definitions. Uh, some of them I've worked with previously in different capacities and know and respect um, on certain levels. Um, and I wish they would go back and, and look again at um, the implications of what they signed as well as realizing that it's not just a matter of signing and debating anti-Semitism um, or, you know, or definitions of anti-Semitism, but it's the necessity of fighting anti-Semitism that we need as well. An academic discussion is fine, but it can't be limited to the world of academia. There are enough academic issues related to anti-Semitism, certainly on campus. Um, but what we require now are people who are committed to taking, going out of the debating society and into the, um, the struggle against anti-Semitism in today's world. Mm -hmm. um, may I add? Sorry? Yes, go ahead. Uh, please. Uh, thank you, Mark, for that. I think you've put it really uh, very forcefully, very, um, very concise the manner. I would like to point at a certain sequence that we have seen since 2020. I don't have to tell you, February 2020, the corona burst into our lives. And in a matter of weeks, in a matter of weeks, material started flooding from dozens of countries to say that Jews and Israelis are responsible for orchestrating the virus, distributing it, because we would uh, find first the medicine and the a vaccination against it, and then we sell it to the whole sick world that we have infested with, et cetera, et cetera. There was a rise, a rise, dramatic rise in a matter of a few weeks that lasted some two, three months of accusations of harsh uh, materials and the ugliest kind of caricatures you could think of. And then came the George Floyd matter. The, the death, the, uh, the brutal death of George Floyd, 
And there was another wave of accusations. Jews were slave traders, the Israeli police uh, trained the American police, uh, and so on and so forth. Another set of accusations that took another arg other arguments, but went on with the same ugly wording and ugly. I think it froze. It was lost, Dina, uh, for at least for a moment here. Uh, I'd like to move on uh, and bring in Malcolm and William Deroff to participate in our Q&A. Um, Malcolm, can you introduce uh, William to our audience? I'd be happy to. I'm uh, very pleased to announce to, and to introduce uh, William's presence. He is the CEO of the Conference of Presidents and it's been so for, I think, the last 18 months. He's done a great job and continuing to grow the conference in this difficult time of COVID. He formerly worked ahead of the Washington office of JFNA and held other positions in the political realm and other realms and um, is a prolific Twitterer on, in, on in the internet uh, where he has a large following. William, um, let me ask you a question. Is he going to introduce me then? You know, we have to... <laughs> I thought you got an introduction. And it, and yeah, Malcolm I... doesn't need any introduction. <laughs> there we go. Okay, thank you. And, and you can you can find him on uh, Snapchat, Twitter, Facebook. He's the king <laughs> of social media. If you look very hard. Right. <laughs> uh, William, over the last year, the Conference of Presidents has made the wide adoption of the IRA working definition a major priority. Uh, uh, I hope you think that's true. Why did the Jewish organiza organizational world make this such a high priority? And what were you hearing from your constituent organizations uh, about uh, that led you to put so many resources into this fight? Great, thank you. Uh, thank you, Malcolm, for the introduction, Ira. Thank you for the question and thank you uh, to the moment and, and everyone else for putting this on. Uh, before discussing Ira, we need to be absolutely clear about first principles. The Jewish community has the absolute right to define the hatred that is targeting us. This is a right that wouldn't be denied to any other minority and must be asserted affirmatively in the face of repeated challenges and rejections. To your question, the Jewish organizational world is generally in agreement on the importance of the IRA definition. Some of our member organizations were intimately involved in the drafting of the definition. And the definition reflects the consensus position of the Jewish community and demonstrably links us with the many adopters of the definition, including as Mark and others have mentioned, 30 nations and many, many more hundreds of NGOs, universities, sports teams, and local governments. Uh, our conference organizations, there are 53 conference organizations, 51 of them have adopted the definition, which again speaks to the fact that this is the consensus position that is accepted by the vast majority of organized uh, American Jewry. We believe strongly that in order to fight something, you must define it. And our member organizations have repeatedly said that combating anti-Semitism should be a top priority and IRA brings clarity to that fight. It's also a definition that we generally agree on in principle, making it a uniting force at this essential moment. Thanks, William. Uh, Malcolm, I've got a question for you. Um, from By my rough calculation, you've worked something like 60, almost 60 years in the Jewish organizational world. Um, how do the levels of anti-Semitism that we've seen in the United States in the last few months uh, how do they compare to levels we've seen in the past? Uh, and what are the implications from your perspective uh, of the recent wave of anti-Semitism for the American Jewish community? Uh, and what you think the community should prioritize as a way of responding to these levels? Okay, thank you. And I just wanna note that I started at my bar mitzvah, so that's how you get up to that count. But I want to, um, to really take your question, all of your questions, and try to answer them in a coherent way, but it really requires a book, not an answer, to analyze where we are today, how did we get here? And I think it is a unique moment, and I do not recall a time in these past decades which uh, really reached the level of hatred and anti-Semitism that we experience today, and I think there are various factors that explain it, including the distance from the Shoah, many other things that uh, we can discuss. Uh, but this is a very charged and politically divisive time, uh, which complicates the efforts to address anti-Semitism. Um, we see multiple themes 
that are being adopted and targeted in the various anti-Semitic manifestations, both physical and ideological, um, educational. In so many realms, do we see the expressions of anti-Semitism being tolerated and even accepted increasingly. And this is something which I think is of priority concern to all of us because it's not gonna go away. There is no way to cure anti-Semitism. It will be with us. It's like uh, viruses. We're not gonna eradicate. We can attack one, we can isolate them, but we're not gonna eliminate anti-Semitism. Our goal is to push it back under the rocks. It is to educate to reach out, to, to enlist and build as many coalitions as possible. I, I believe that the onus falls on the non-Jewish community. We're the victims, not the perpetrators. And we need to enlist the allies and build the coalitions like we did for Soviet Jewry and build a movement, not another organization, where you put aside the labels and, it, and have everybody work together, building on the individual initiatives of the various organizations. There are really many wonderful things going on in IRA is a perfect example of how cooperative efforts yield results. And I think you'll find much greater resonance than the people realize in the non-Jewish world who are troubled by it, but don't know how to give expression or how to act on, on this. So we have to come up with the formulas for what is effective action. The legislation in 30 states that the counters BDS is very important. We have to try and get domestic terrorism laws against hate crimes. There are many things we can do, including insisting that educational systems incorporate anti-Semitism and not let the current efforts to revise history uh, to distort our past or our present, which only means that you restructure the future in negative ways. So number one, we have to understand the dynamic of anti-Semitism, what's behind it, who's behind it, the difference I think from past years is the existence of the internet. It took Hitler months or even a year to spread a big lie. It's done now in nanoseconds. And no matter how many places we knock off, if you can knock off a thousand, 5,000 come up. And we have to look at the state sponsors, Iran, the PA, Turkey, others who are involved. And, and this is very sophisticated. It's very technical. It's very complicated. To, to fight it, but we have to devote the resources and there are a series of uh, initiatives right now with wonderful people at universities and in organizations. And I think by collectivizing those efforts and sharing our resources, we can do much more. And especially in regard to the campus, which has become a breeding ground, we've seen over the past year, even though campuses were largely not in session, how much has happened, faculty groups adopting hostile resolutions against the uh, against Israel and against uh, Jews. We see the actions on the campuses. It's not something you can dismiss as youthful exuberance. This is something that is shaping the minds and the, and the focus of, of the next generation of, of leaders. And whereas in the past they would attack individual Jews and, and you, you know carry out the traditional anti-Semitism, today they also attack the collective Jew, which is the state of Israel. And with intersectionality, which Dina referred to that when we see the linkages between some of the domestic causes and, and other uh, concerns being linked to this and being exploited and being distorted by it, uh, this also complicates uh, our efforts uh, even more. And just one note, I know she, she said she doesn't like the word hate, but anti-Semitism is an antiseptic term. We need to call it Jew hatred. We need to be, use bold terms and bold expressions. We need to draw the line and ask people where they stand on which side. We can't have the mealy mouth excuses of the past because today everybody has to make a determination and be willing to stand up on one side or the other with us or against us. We need to get state, federal, local legislators. We need to get entertainment and sports and other figures, religious, academic, and educational figures to speak out. Those who have influence, those who can impact especially younger people, we need them to speak up because today truth is the victim. And while Jews are the first victims as all of history shows us, we're never the last. And you see in France today that uh, the Catholic church is, is the victim of more than 50% of the anti-Semitic crimes. It doesn't, it may start with us, it doesn't end with us. So we need to build and build across uh, all kinds of uh, bridges to all kinds of communities. I think we will find a lot of receptivity 
We have to do a lot of educational work, creative educational work, and we have to set standards and be willing to have the courage to stand up, to speak out, to take the lumps for it, because it won't always be easy. But I think in the end, we can accomplish a great deal. Thank you, Malcolm. Um, you mentioned universities and college campuses. One of our uh, participants asked us about how the working definition particularly affects uh, Jewish students who are facing sometimes hostile environments on college campuses. Any one of our uh, participants, uh, our panel, uh, have a response? So uh, um, I guess I can answer or say something about that. Um, I think that it is an important tool for Jewish students on campus um, because again, um, our students are not necessarily always the most educated, have the greatest background. They're out there by themselves. Their first times are sometimes away from home and so on. Um, and they need support, they need help, they need understanding what they're facing and what they're dealing with. Um, and sometimes statements can be made that, especially if they're coming from authority figures or from uh, figures who are you know, uh, claiming backing from uh, larger groups and, and, and movements um, that are difficult to respond to. And having this as a definition on their one part is very helpful for them. The other part of it that's very practical as well is that President Trump signed an executive order on anti-Semitism um, that basically says that complaints that go under the Title VI Civil Rights Act um, of discrimination on campus um, that are brought to the attention of Department of Education, the IRA definition can be used not to determine innocence or guilt, so to speak, on it, or, or you know whether there's complicity or not complicity in that regard, but it can be used to find out if the action that is being protested um, or brought to their attention does qualify as anti-Semitic. It gives a barometer, again, that can be used in judging and evaluating whether there really is an anti-Semitic act on campus, and then that can be addressed um, under, let's say, the Title VI uh, conditions of the Department of Education, thus protecting the civil rights of Jewish students on campus as well. And uh, to add to that, we, we've seen, for instance, that executive order, which uh, concretizes the IRA definition in which the Biden administration, which rescinded many executive orders from the Trump administration has not rescinded. And so, uh, and on a foreign policy uh, level has embraced IRA. And so we're hopeful that will continue uh, at the education department. Uh, but the executive order uh, just came into uh, showing its utility at UIUC at the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign, uh, where after years of anti-Semitic activity, um, the executive order is what really was used by the Department of Education to force the university to face the pressure uh, of having anti-Semitism in its midst. So it's an excellent tool to focus uh, university administrators. And that's really where a lot of the focus needs to be here, that the, the diversity affairs offices, who are usually the ones at universities uh, that engage in this subject matter, have no real knowledge of anti-Semitism. It's not in their training. It's not in, uh, for the most part, uh, in their backgrounds. And so what the definition does is uh, it helps to, again, focus the administration on recognizing what is anti-Semitism, what is not anti-Semitism, so that they can then move forward to ensure uh, that Jewish college students are protected. A quick follow-up to what William just said. I was told by a senior Department of Education official that not only have they not rescinded the, uh, the Trump uh, executive order on it, they have no intention of doing that at this point and continue to um, act upon it as if it's, you know, uh, continuing it as a, as a binding uh, policy document. For good reason. Um, uh, one of our participants is asking uh, about Durban. I think some of us uh, who are engaged yeah. in this uh, assume that everybody knows all the historical facts. Dina, you mentioned Durban and, they, yes. and this person asked us, what is Durban? Oh, <laughs> well, uh, I'll have to be short about it. Uh, well, Durban uh, has become really not just the name of a place, even not just the name for a, a place where a conference took place, uh, but a kind of a symbol of uh, uh, anti-Semitic, and anti-Israeli acts being hurled in a few days in a, uh, a, in an intense, in very intensive uh, a way, and being a starting point for anti-Semitic um, activity. I must tell you that uh, 
um, is that in Durban, you, you could see in action, you could see how, how a wave of anti-Semitism, anti-Zionism um, uh, begins. And um, I must say also that there was not a lot of violence, but there was violence as well that you could see. We tried to put up um, a press conference to explain Israel's position, etc. It was burst into by ladies wooing and throwing at us oranges and books and uh, Durban to whoever asked for it was quite an experience. And uh, what year and who was a sponsor, Dina? Uh -huh. when, when did it take place and who sponsored the Durban conference? Uh, well, it was the UN, United Nations. It was, uh, that's a good question. Thank you for that. Because the Durban conference was met originally meant to be a tool in the fight against racism. It was a reaction to the waves of immigrants who came in the 1990s and put on the table the question of who is a Gastarbeiter, who is a refugee, who is an immigrant, what is each of them entitled to from the point of view of rights and civil rights. And uh, as a reaction to their coming, the extreme right started flourishing and acting uh, against them and the left for them. So it was a, um, a social and political first, first uh, uh, of the first priority problem. And so the, EU, the United Nations, after having failed in a few former conferences, decided to have a world huge conference to tackle racism. But the next day, in, in a matter of a day and two, it, can, it turned against Israel. May I, uh, Ira, tell you, the, if you allow, the following. I came after two days. I came to the Belgian ambassador who was there in charge of this and that and asked him, how come for years you are preparing a conference on racism? And before you say Jack Robinson, it is against Jews and, and Israel. And he says, listen, after a day or two, we realized that if we really have a conference on racism and all countries that were subject to colonialism and to colonial conquests will come now asking for the rights and for the property, Europe will go bankrupt in a very short time. So what's the solution? To pick on Israel and the Jews. Let can, me I ask, just say, can I add yeah, one thing to it? Because of the context of what you asked, where it came from, that people have to go back to 1975 and the Zionism Racism Resolution and why the importance of history and of maintaining history is so significant. Because without understanding the dynamic of that and how that led, and it took 25 years to, to get it repealed, uh, was the basis not only for that event, but also for what we see now in the BDS movement and other manifestations that you have to see the total picture and the flow of events over these decades to understand how we got to where we are today. And also uh, another quick follow-up is that this fall is the 20th anniversary of the Durban uh, conference and there's gonna be uh, plans for a commemoration event at the UN in New York. The Biden administration, UK, Canada, and about eight other countries, seven or eight other countries have already announced that they will be boycotting any of the Durban commemorations because of the hijacking of the process for anti-Semitic purposes. Um, and so the U.S. will not be participating in anything uh, that relates to commemorating the uh, Durban conference itself. And lastly, just to put a bow on it, uh, it really focuses attention on what we just talked about that we saw with the recent Gaza war, which is where anti-Zionism is really just a, uh, a facade for anti-Semitism. Uh, and Durban is, uh, was, was evidence number one for that uh, for the, not the start of that, but certainly for uh, the beginning of that in this century. Malcolm, you mentioned earlier social media. One of our participants asked, 
who's monitoring social media for this type of hatred? But you need a lot of resources to really combat the hatred. I, I was once taken by a firm to see the dark web and you go down and down like into Dante's Inferno and you see the thousands of websites, anti-Semitic websites that places like Iran and others are manufacturing and you close one, 10 come up, you close 10, 100 come up. So it requires a constant effort and monitoring billions and billions of entries into the, in, on the internet. And there are organizations and groups that are now doing it, doing it successfully, but it's such a huge undertaking. It needs a lot of resources. The community has to invest more. We also have to do more to produce our own positive uh, material on the internet to counter it, to get people, credible people, as I mentioned before, who uh, can get the message out to large audiences that they uh, that are that follow them? Uh, there are influencers that we don't even know whose names most of the people on this call and we as well don't know, but they can reach 40 million, 50 million people. We have to reach out to them. We have to become more sophisticated. We have to turn to the younger generation that knows much better how to do the how to play the internet game. But it is, it is a dangerous weapon, just as it is a positive force when used in the right way. And we have to hold the major companies to account. We have to do more to see to it that anti-Semitic websites are not tolerated, that they're wiped out, that there are ways with technology to quickly discover those uh, messages that are uh, prom prom promulgating hate and promoting violence. It is the tool of preference today. And I think we, we all have to, again, why I believe a collective effort is so essential to have the resources to be effective in this. There are at least three tools, technical tools today, uh, developed to monitor antisemitism in social media. And there are, according to the working definition, and here the working definition also plays a role in order to monitor and to ask the big servers to take these posts off. And there are now agreements, new agreements with them to take it off in 24 hours. Uh, if not, they would be fined, etc. It starts working, but it is still at the beginning. The reality is that the, first of all, a couple of things. One is that um, the large companies, Facebook, for example, and things like that, literally do not know what they're hosting. They have no knowledge of what's out there. So they're dependent on either very small teams that they have set up of uh, researchers um, and reviewers or for information that's brought to them um, by people who complain like ourselves. So um, the Wisdom Falls Center, ADL, a lot of these groups have relationships with Facebook and so on. We can um, complain about something, we'll get a response. A lot of times we're successful, a lot of times we're not successful. Um, I don't think that Facebook is necessarily the issue. Um, it's a problem, but there is a little, there, there at least is communication and receptivity there. Um, and Facebook has said that they will use the working definitions. They're not going to adopt it formally, but it's part of their process. It's part of their toolkit. Um, and uh, so there's something going on there. The problem is that it's such a wide world out there um, that you have places like Gab or Telegram uh, Malcolm was talking about the dark uh, web. Before you even get to that, uh, the Gab, the Telegram, which are the sites that were used, for example, for planning the, uh, the January 6th insurrection. Uh, a lot of that happened there. A lot of the communication happened there. Those are sites that embrace and are willingly accept extremists of all type, particularly anti-Semitic and so on. And they have no interest in um, you know, uh, bowing to pressure, as they would call it, or being in communication or being open or receptive to our complaints. Um, so we have issues with groups like that, with places like that. A VK coming out of Russia is one of the largest social media networks in the world, has absolutely no controls. Um, there's a lot of material on there that's very difficult and very objectionable. We really don't have a lever with VK. We've been looking at them for a number of years now um, and trying to figure out the best way to approaching them. Um, and if anyone has any suggestions, I'm certainly open to it. Um, but there's a lot of material that goes out there that is coming not just from the channels of Facebook and Google, but from the more unregulated and resistant to regulated um, social media channels. SB asks us, can one be against Israeli policies and not be anti-Semitic? Absolutely. I would say that that's if that's uh, the case, one would be 
at least 50% of the is joining at least 50% of the Israeli and Jewish world community 90%. every day. Yeah, every single of day. Course. Of course. But we have to make that distinction because people use that against us. And William and I encounter it all the time that, the, that we always make clear, you can criticize a policy of Israel. That's not what they're doing. They're denying Israel's right to exist. They deny Israel the mm -hmm. standing of other countries. And we have to be clear in that distinction because it, it's a boogeyman that they put up as if we're saying you can't criticize. We all criticize policies of our own government or the government of Israel. And, and Mark is right, but I think it's 90% of Israelis would be classified as anti-Semites. <laughs> and, and, but but it's, it's very important because this is one of the covers they use to defend it and to say, oh, you, you're not allowing criticism, you're limiting free speech. No, we're protecting free speech. All of the IRA, all of these things help to protect the right of people to speak legitimately, but not to engage in the kind of hate-filled, evil, conspiratorial exercises that we see so often. And especially this lie that we're trying to, to curtail the right of people to say if they differ or disagree with some particular policy of Israel. That's never the case. That's not what Zionism racism was about. It's not what BDS is about. It's not what about this campaign of anti-Semitism. It's about the right of Jews to have the rights of all other people and of the Jewish state to thrive and survive and have the rights of all other states, and especially to defend its own citizens. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? I think yeah, I, I just I, I just add absolutely Malcolm is uh, right on, on the mark there. This is a canard that's used uh, in order to stifle uh, a real discussions of anti-Semitism by saying, oh, you're going to, uh, anybody who has any criticism of the Israeli government is anti-Semite. That's like saying anybody who has criticism of the American government is anti-American. Uh, it is, uh, it's a ridiculous canard and it's uh, absolutely not enshrined in the IRA definition and not something that any of us here who in our own way are critical of Israeli government's uh, past, present and future uh, would attest to. And, and just to quote from the document itself, IRA specifically says that criticisms of Israel um, similar to any other country is not anti-Semitic. I think yep. that's pretty clear and pretty evident to anybody who's not biased or um, has a, you know, a, 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 a interested reading of it. Rick asks yep. us, why are people still using the 1890 German term of anti-Semitismus based on horrible racial theories about false inferior race of Semites? Why not use Malcolm's term of anti-Jewish or anti-Israel, et cetera? Hmm. Yeah, absolutely right. Well, well, it, there, is a a quite, there is quite a debate uh, which has been recently raised by Professor David Engel from the University of New York, formerly from Tel Aviv, who said uh, much as the person who asked this question, uh, that the term anti-Semitism should not be used because um, it encompasses so many cases or so many manifestations along so many centuries in so many various places and times and uh, societies, etc. It's too much. Um, well, uh, I perhaps it is not uh, such an accurate term um, with a hyphen. It used, it used to be written with a hyphen, which says anti-hyphen, hyphen, anti-Semitism, uh, uh, which means that Semitism is a certain entity and you are against it. Now, once you took off the hyphen, anti-Semitism has become a term, a certain term that indeed stands for hostility, Malcolm says hatred, etc., against Jews. The Semites in this equation were long ago forgotten. Uh, what kind of Semites were there in Europe in the, in the uh, 1880s, except for, for the Jews? You know that Elie Wiesel, may rest in peace, said that uh, we should abandon uh, the term Holocaust. And why is that? Because so many groups and so many um, societies that feel victims use it and say, okay, we also had the Holocaust. And so it becomes, it loses its original meaning. But he says, I don't have another term. I don't have another term that has caught and he's, is ingrained. And so I think is anti-Semitism. It is a term 
And even if it's not, it was not terribly accurate because it involved this entity of Semites, this is the turn today in trying to artificially, artificially take it to another or turn it to another one like a, a Jewish hatred or anti-Jewishness, etc. cetera, um, it, it won't work. You know that Goebbels wanted the term anti-Semitism off because at the, the time there were Arab diplomats in Berlin and it insulted them. So we said, let's go for anti-Jewish hatred or anti-Judaism. -Ju anti but it, a term needs to catch and to be ingrained. I agree with Tina, particularly the last point about the term being the recognized term. And we're talking about really fighting a battle now in public consciousness, um, which means that the recognition of the term is very important. In the academic world and the scholarly world, there's a lot of debate about, Dina touched upon one of the things David Engel said, that you, you can raise, others have pointed out that, you know, the term um, of called for Jude Judeophobia, as Peter Schaefer did, or, or, or um, anti-Judaism, -Jude, uh, anti-Jewish. Um, part of that goes back historically is that, you, you know, people make a distinction between uh, what happened before the rise of Christianity, after the rise of Christianity, Mars' uh, definition of the uh, term anti-Semitism um, in the late 19th century was meant to encompass the new racial science that was going in. Now we know that's a pseudoscience that we used to just that was used to justify racism, but it, it allowed the encompassing of a wider range rather than just the religiously oriented anti-Judaism uh, previously. By the way, Mar ended up repudiating and, and uh, all this stuff and, and ended up. Uh, I, I think having positive words about Zionism at the end of his life. Um, but the reality is that this is a term that most of the world understands, ex deals with, uses, recognizes, and for that it has utility. And again, here I'll go back to what I said earlier. You have an academic discussion, we draw upon the academic discussion for our information, the best knowledge and so on, but we also have to balance that with what's practical, what's real, because we're dealing with a practical and real issue, not just with an academic issue. And in that sense, anti-Semitism is the word that works the best, I think, for all of us at this point. But we're not talking about eliminating the term. But if you see the polls, when they ask young people what anti-Semitism means, they can't define it. And Jew hatred is very clear. Judenhass, it's not a new term and it's not a new debate. And I don't think we have to extend it here. But the point is not to eliminate the term of anti-Semitism. But now we need to have people in clear terms say, not something that is a generic term, but to talk about what it is that we are fighting. And we are fighting hatred against Jews and the Jewish state. And I think the clearer we are with it and, and enhancing the definitions in, in whatever way we can, will have a greater impact. It's, it's a different era. People don't look for long terminologies. You gotta be clear to the point and get the message out. And I think Jew hatred does that and why many people have started to adopt it, not to the exclusion of anti-Semitism but to, to direct and to get the message when you see end Jew hatred now and all of those things now, because that's the era we're living in. And that's what we have to do and, and talk to the PR people and let's see what they say, uh, the experts on public opinion about how we can be most effective. Well, Malcolm, you're gonna have the last word. Um, mm -hmm. I apologize to our audience because we have a, a, a ton of other questions, uh, but I wanna thank our panelists, uh, particularly Dina, who's now pushing 12 midnight or something in Israel. Thank you, Dina, and thanks all of our panelists for taking the time, and I'll turn it over to Suzanne. Great, thank you. Thank you all. Thank you, uh, Dina, Mark, Ira, Malcolm, William, for this very important conversation today. I also want to thank the Conference of Presidents for being a partner in today's program. I wanted to let everybody know that we'll be sending a follow-up email later this week, and we'll provide links to resources um, and uh, links to the definition, which is also in the uh, chat that you can uh, look at that further. Uh, also, thank you to everybody for joining us. Uh, we will, uh, please don't forget to go to Moment's website where you can sign up for Moment's anti-Semitism monitor and be sure to register for next week's program about Jimmy Carter. Again, thank you everybody, and we will see you next time.